If you can read the text on the screen, you realize we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8 as our key text this evening. Our lesson title is coming from that particular verse and forms lesson 7 in our series about important questions that have been asked in the Bible. And so this particular question is, who will go for us? We remember the triumphant answer that Isaiah gives, uh, here am I, send me. Well, what brings a person to that point? How do you get to that kind of an answer? What instills that in your heart? What gives you that drive to answer God in that way when He's asking for people to go for Him today with the Great Commission? How do you get to that point? Well, we're going to look at what brought Isaiah to that point in our lesson this evening. We're going to be doing a little work in the book of Isaiah, not much in the previous chapters, but a little bit, because what happens in chapters 1 through 5 is leading up to what's taking place in chapter 6. And so uh, if we look in chapter 1 and verse 1, the very beginning of this book of Isaiah, you have the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So he is a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah, which he saw during the reigns of, here's our time stamp, during the reigns of Uzziah. It turns out later in chapter 6 and verse 1 that he got his call to go into this ministry of a prophet. He got that in the last year of Uzziah, in the year that he died. So we're right at the tail end of the reign of Uzziah, and then he goes into the reign of Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And if you'll do a little work with that, um, I have a page marked in a book in my office. I um, wish I could remember the, the name of it. Um, Halley's Bible Handbook. I have a page just eternally marked there. I haven't moved that marker for years and years and years. It is about the kings of Judah, the kings of Israel, who they were, when they reigned, how long they reigned, whether they were good or bad or in between. And I keep that page marked because I look at that all of the time. And if you will look at something like that, a resource like that, you can see how long each of these kings reigned, about when that was along in the B.C. timeline, and you get a feel for the time era that Isaiah is prophesying in. We're going to be in the second half of the 8th century B.C. Most will mark this uh, beginning time of his prophecy, 735 to 739 B.C., somewhere around there. He begins his ministry as Uzziah is in his last year, and, uh, and he continues that through these other kings. You have the three major deportations of the people of Judah into Babylonian captivity beginning about 605 B.C. So Isaiah is beginning his reign about 130, 135 years before they're deported in that first wave going over into Babylonian captivity. He's about 130 years previous to that. And if you look at the timeline of these kings, his ministry would have lasted maybe 40 to 50 years. That being the case, as he ends his ministry, they're within a couple generations of going into Babylonian captivity. He's warning them, he's preaching to them, he's trying to bring them to repentance. This is uh, one of the last efforts that's going to be made to turn the tide before it's everlastingly too late and they go into that 70 years of captivity. The call of Isaiah into his prophetic role is recorded, as I said, in the beginning of chapter 6. The first five chapters are this dismal picture of the southern kingdom, all the things that have gone wrong there. And if you would just scan through your Bible, chapters 1 through 5, and a lot of Bibles will have uh, headings supplied by the translator, headings of what's going on in these various paragraphs. And you can scan that rather quickly, even while I'm talking, and see some of the things that have gone wrong in the southern kingdom. And it's leading up to the call of Isaiah to begin his preaching to them. So I'd like us to think about two areas of application as we look at Isaiah's material and leading up to our question that God is asking, who will go for us? Who's going to go on this mission for the sake of heaven? 
to reach these people and to preach to them. Two areas of application. One is, we live in a world needing the Great Commission as desperately or more so than they were needing the message of Isaiah. How bad of a shape is our world in? Just take a look at it and you think about the difficult soil of going out with a biblical message into our culture. How desperate is this situation we're in? And how many people want to do that? How many people are anxious to talk about God's truth to a world that needs it and contradict the morals of our time? Contradict what's politically correct in our time. Tread on this path of religious modernism and a melting pot of religion where everything's okay and everybody tolerates and accepts everybody else. Who wants to go out with this message and to ruffle all of that? So you think about Isaiah and if you just get a glimpse of what's gone wrong in the southern kingdom of Judah, you realize what a difficult place he's in. And then this struggle, application number two, this struggle to maintain doctrinal integrity in this culture that's increasingly desirous of this I'm okay, you're okay religion. Well, that's kind of like where Isaiah is at. So the title of our lesson, Who Will Go For Us? Who's going to go on this difficult task? And how does Isaiah come to accept it with great zeal? So the book opens up with a picture of the southern kingdom of Judah as though they are a rebellious child. Chapter 1, verse 2, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up but they have revolted against me. He's talking about the southern kingdom of Judah and maybe a little bit of inclusion of the northern kingdom that's, that's uh, already going to be going into Assyrian captivity. So he's raised up these sons and they've revolted against him. He's describing his people. And then chapter 5, verse 20, they've lost sight of right and wrong. They can't see it anymore. They don't understand what it is. Chapter 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. They have no sense anymore. It goes on, Who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. They have no sight when it comes to right and wrong. Who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They have no taste. They have no sense. They have no sight. They have no taste when it comes to right and wrong. They're that lost. They're that mixed up, and that's the way our world is today. They don't understand it anymore. Right and wrong don't have a meaning to people the way that it used to. Then Isaiah 5, verse 24, for they have rejected the law of the Lord. How they get so mixed up on right and wrong? How their morals go downhill like that? Because they've rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. They lost the touchstone to their morals when they did that. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 presents them as refusing the discipline of the Lord. And I'm reading New American Standard Update. Maybe if you have uh, NIV or something else, it might even be a little bit clearer to you what's going on here. They're rejecting the discipline of God. And here's the way it's worded, verses 5 and 6. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick, the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. And if you keep reading in chapter 1, you're reading the kind of chastisement that God's been giving them, the, the, the uh, distress in the land. All the things that have gone wrong, all the things that are crazy in their life, and they're not getting it. They're not listening to God. They're not listening to the discipline. They're not seeing the cause of their trouble and why everything's gone awry the way that it has. So they're just not understanding it. And he's saying, where are you going to be stricken again? It's not registering with you at all. They're numb to the meanings of their trouble. 
Uh, the United States of America looks around and so many things are going wrong. So many things are just so mixed up and it's just chaos and they look around and they don't get it. They've rejected the Word of God and they don't understand that's, that's a big part of the reason of what's going on and why everything's going the way that it is. So God then, on top of that, is rejecting their worship because it's full of hypocrisy. Chapter 113, verse 13, Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure, listen to this, here's the problem. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. They don't go together. Stop bringing your offerings to me. Straighten up your life. Get your life together. Make your life so that it agrees with the doctrine, that it agrees with the worship. Then come worship me. But I can't endure iniquity and the solemn assembly because they don't fit together. I won't receive it. Then chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, wash yourselves. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. He's not telling them, hide it from me. How are you going to hide from God? He's not telling them, go ahead and do your evil, just don't let me see it. That's not what he's saying. He said, get it out of my sight. Next line, cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. That implies they're either not doing that or maybe even doing the very opposite of it. And he said, you need to stop it. I see everything. Get it out of my sight. Wherever you do it, however you do it, I'll see it. Get it out of my sight by ceasing to do evil. So God's intending to plead with them again through the work of Isaiah. This is such a great verse. Chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. What an offer. What an offer God is making them. And they don't realize how close they are to this captivity and what that's going to be like for their great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren. What's that going to be like? What are they bringing down on their heads? Listen, come. let's reason together. Your sins are thick and vibrant in this crimson color. They can be white as snow, like wool. We can take care of this. What an offer God is making to them. Is it any different? with the offer he makes in Christ today. Those who have the greatest problems in life should hear the offer in Christ with the greatest impact. None of us are without sin. All of us should realize the great offer and leap at the opportunity, ears open, heart open, mind open, to receive healing and forgiveness from God for our sins. Today God is pleading with the lost, not through Isaiah, but through us. That's how He pleads with the lost world today. You get to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, the Spirit and the bride say, come. The bride, that's the church, that's you, that's me. Through the Spirit and the Bride, us, our work, through the Spirit and what He has delivered in the Word. Here's the message through the Spirit. Here it is. And through the Bride, that's us. He says, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take of the water of life without cost. Will we answer? Who will go for us? Will we answer that great call? Then we get to Isaiah's... I hit the wrong button. Can you bring me back? Revive me. Thank you. Uh, we get to Isaiah's vision in chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. This is remarkable. Who wants the job? 
Who wants to go out into a culture like that, like he was facing, like we're facing? Who wants to go out into that, try to convert the thinking of people who are so distorted? They don't get right and wrong. They don't have any sense. They don't have any sight. They don't have any taste when it comes to right and wrong. They'll argue with you about it. It's nonsense. Who wants to go out into that and try to make a difference? The inclination, and you know it because this is what, this is what you and I do most of the time, right? The inclination is just mind your own business. Hey, just mind your own business. Maintain your own relationship to God quietly and privately and just let it run its course. Just let everything run its course. They'll figure it out if they want to. But just mind your own business and keep your relationship between you and God intact privately and don't say anything. It's too late. Your efforts won't be appreciated and it might make things hard in your life. You might be bringing trouble to your own life. If you say anything, if you step into this, who knows what's going to happen to your job? Who knows what's going to happen in your neighborhood? Who knows what's going to happen in your family relationships? Just hush. Let them figure it out. That's the inclination of that. It's the vision in chapter 6 that makes the difference. God presents Isaiah with a vision of himself for a reason. And that's what makes the difference. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. What did we just say? Have you seen Jesus my Lord? Have you seen him? How, how do we see him? Think about, would you think about that while I'm reading this vision? I want you to think about how we see our Lord today because it's going to make all the difference. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, with two He flew. Can you imagine that? Have you ever tried to picture that? Have you ever tried to picture the seraphim and their wings and the direction? What do, you, what do you imagine about their shape? What do you imagine about their size? What do you imagine about their color? What do you imagine about their sound? You think about this. What a vision that he's having. And one called out, to another and said, they're talking to each other, the seraphim, these winged heavenly creatures. And as they're speaking one to the other, they're saying, holy, holy, holy. Repeated is emphasis. It's getting louder, bolder, stronger. Holy, holy, holy. Different. Separate unique, sinless. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory, and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And Isaiah, Isaiah is seeing this in a vision. It is vivid and clear to him. Then I said, then Isaiah said to himself, Woe is me. Woe is me, for I am ruined. I am ruined. What do you mean? Because I'm seeing God on His throne. I'm hearing this. I'm feeling this. I'm seeing all... And I realize who God is. Woe is me. I've never seen myself like this. Woe is me. I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he'd taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. Sometimes we feel our sin so deeply, it is so heavy on us, we think, who am I to speak for God? Who am I to try to win the lost? Who am I to convict others of sin and bring the who am I? And he touched his mouth, his lips, and he said, You are cleansed. You can speak for God. Are you cleansed in the blood of the Lamb? He cleanses your mouth to speak for Him. Will you? Who will go for us? You are cleansed. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. And He touched His mouth. Use your words. That's what He's done for Isaiah. When the prophet understands who God is, he has just seen God more clearly than he has ever understood Him before. And then he sees himself clearly for the first time standing beneath God. We do pretty good when we compare ourselves with ourselves. When the TV news comes on and I stand beside that, I fare pretty well. I, I do pretty good. But what about when I stand there and there's God in front of me, behind me, around me, and I'm looking at God. Woe is me, for I am ruined. Do we realize how deeply lost we are in sin? Do we feel the weight of that? Isaiah receives his forgiveness. Imagine that. He has just a moment ago, realized the full weight of his sin, a massive weight, the enormity of his problem. He has just realized that for the first time. And then a moment later is forgiveness and the unbearable is lifted off him. That's all he could, that's all he could stand of it. And now God cleanses him. Now, those events... In chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, that is so important to the next verse. Who will go for us? Why did he answer, here am I, send me? Verses 1 through 7 is the reason why. Chapters 1 through 5 is why I don't want to go. Chapter 6, 1 through 7 is why I want to go why I have to go, why I have to speak. So those verses are so important to becoming God's messenger. We are looking at the process of making a missionary, making a winner of souls. This is the process by which that happens. Conviction of personal sin, conviction of my hopeless condition, experiencing the Lord's cleansing, all of that is real and vivid. Heart, mind, and soul. The response of the life then that is separated to worship and serve God, His worthiness. I don't, I don't have any other choice. I am constrained to do that. I have to. And that's why he answers in verse 8 the way that he does. It would be a difficult work. It would be a thankless task. There would be so much opposition. Chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. He said, go, <clears throat> tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. 
Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return and be healed. It, it sounds like, it sounds like uh, God's telling Isaiah, go fail. What God is telling him is very similar to, to Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still still keep himself holy. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he's done. The idea is, you all get to choose to do whatever you want to do. And if you are filthy and you want to remain filthy in your sins, that's up to you. If you're righteous and you want to remain righteous, you can do that. You choose to do whatever you want to do. Isaiah, you go preach the message. You go tell them the truth from God. You lay it out there for them. They're going to do whatever they want to do. They're going to maintain this corrupt course they're on, or they're going to turn, whatever it is. You just keep going until no one's going to listen anymore. You go until time runs out. When the last grain of sand falls down in that hourglass, you just keep preaching until that grain of sand falls. And he said, how long, Lord, until the cities are devastated and without inhabitant? Houses are without people and the land is utterly desolate. You're going to find a reference to that text in Isaiah 6, 9 through 11. You're going to find a reference to that in the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, and Luke parallels. They're going to be referenced there. I count that as one time. And then you're going to find it in the book of John. You're going to find it in the book of Acts. You're going to find it in the book of Romans. That is referenced in those four sections in the New Testament. That particular reference with an application to it, meaning everything he's telling Isaiah here, that's still relevant to us today. That's referenced in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, it's still relevant to us today. That message is potent today just the way it was back then. We are people who have to hold out the hope of God through teaching until there is no more time. And they're still going to refuse. They're still going to rebel. And they're still going to go into their captivity. So why go through all the effort? Why go through all the struggle? What's the point? Because some would be saved. Because some would be saved. Isaiah 6, 13. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it. And it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is in its stump. There would be a remnant. There would be some who would listen. There would be some who would learn. Unless you keep holding out the hope of God, the word of God, the truth of God, no one's going to have a chance. But some would listen and it was worth that. So where do you begin with that? Where do you begin? In Acts 5, verse 42, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. We talk about going from house to house with the message of the gospel. And sometimes we think about that the way they take a census. They're going to go to this address, and then to the one next to it, and the one next to that, and the one next to that. We're going to cover this block, and then we're going to go around the corner, and we're going to cover that block, and we're going to go through this neighborhood. When we cover that section, then we'll go to this section of the city, and we'll go house to house to house to house in that neat little order. That's what we call cold door knocking. That's tough work. There, there's a need for that sometimes. 
there's a need for that sometimes. But the house to house in Matthew 5.42 is not that. Where this begins is more like that crisscross pattern you see on the screen. You think about how it happened in the New Testament. Andrew went to find his brother Peter. Philip found his friend Nathaniel. Cornelius called his household together. When Jesus healed the demon-possessed man, he was told, Return to your house and describe what's been done. Go from house to house. Who do you know? What house do you have access to? It may not be next to this one, next to this one, next to this one. It might be over here or over there, but you go from house to house, and this house leads to that house. This person that you know, they have a mother, they have a father, they have a brother, they have a sister. And this house leads to that house, leads to that house, leads to that house. You go house to house where you have contact, where you have relationship, where it leads you to the next one. But you begin where you're at with those that you know in the houses you have an open door to. And that's where you begin. When we repair our relationship to God, that is intended to enter our relationships with each other. Not just to remain me and my God quietly and privately and I'm not getting mixed up in the rest of it. It's not that. When we repair our relationship with God, it is meant to enter our personal relationships in life. Like Isaiah, we begin by being convicted of our own sin before God, being cleansed through the sacrifice of Christ, reach out to the souls that we already know. I asked you something about this earlier in the lesson, and, and I'm about ready to close with this. How do we see God today? You see His handiwork in nature all the time, right? And this is the mind and will of God revealed to mankind. Clearer than Isaiah ever saw him. And then let me ask you this. What are we supposed to be thinking about in the Lord's Supper? What do you suppose that's really about? Reimagining the life of Jesus, why he came to the earth, how he died on the cross, how he rose from the grave, the blood that he shed on our behalf, how he has cleansed us. What are we supposed to be thinking about with that? How do we see God today? And if we really pay attention to it, how is it supposed to affect us? Who will go for us? Here am I. Send me. It doesn't happen without seeing God. It won't happen without seeing the reality of these words, letting them sink in. God is. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We can come to His throne through Christ. That's something we have to share. You feel the weight? Feel the burden removed from you. And then here am I, send me. Do you need to respond to the invitation of Jesus the Christ this evening? Erring child of God, let him start making the difference he's supposed to make in your life. Repent of the things that have been holding you back, sins you've been permitting in your life, and get into this with both feet. Those who have never named the name of Christ and put him on in the waters of baptism, there is relief from sin and there is a new life to be lived under the direction of our Lord and Savior. If we can help you, assist you in any way, please come forward while we stand and sing.